Welcome along to Live On Air this evening. Uh, we've got Laurel and we've got Stuart here, and we're, we're going to be talking primarily about Laurel's work in nutrition science. And I think the very best place to start, Laurel, is tell us a bit about yourself and what you do. Yeah, so um, I'm Laurel. I'm from North Carolina. I'm not a Kiwi. <laughs> Um, moved to New Zealand four years ago, and during that time I was studying online, and that's when I got my Bachelor's of Nutrition Science. So once I graduated, um, I really wasn't satisfied with, I guess, the just the way that we're taught to engage with clients. We're more so taught to give them a meal plan and then kind of send them on their way. And so that didn't settle well with me of I've seen the success or the lack thereof with um, people just being told what to do. So I looked into this thing called Precision Nutrition, which is the world's leading nutrition coaching company, and decided to get certified as a nutrition coach. So even though I had the qualification of a qualified nutritionist after four plus years of studying, um, I took a course online to become a nutrition coach so that I could actually facilitate habit change. So it's more so than just giving a diet plan and telling someone what to do, but I actually work long term with people to change one habit at a time. Laurel, you've also uh, been to ministry school and done training for all kinds of theological and spiritual work. Tell us a little bit about that part yeah. of your background. Yep, so when I graduated high school, um, I didn't know what I wanted to study. I had no interest in nutrition at that point, but I knew that I just really loved Jesus, and um, I wanted to do something that, I guess, took a year out to really pursue him and figure out just the practicality of what life was supposed to look like. Like, we have all these dreams. As believers, we have dreams of what we wanted to do, but I didn't know where university fit into that because um, I always just dreamt of just being a missionary and being around a bunch of orphans and in Africa and in the bush. So I had no clue, um, yeah, what to study. So by God's grace, my dad, who values university a lot, let me go across the um, California, so across the country from North Carolina, and attended Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry. <laughs> so it's a bit of a... Um, it's hard to describe. It's not your typical ministry school um, in the sense of it's not just, it's theology based, obviously. It's scripturally based, um, sound in the Bible. Everything we learn has come from the Bible, but it's also very empowering as far as learning how to walk it out of what the spirit filled life looks like of our great commission is to, you know, do what Jesus did of the way he walked on earth we're supposed to follow suit. Like he set the perfect example for what life as believers should look like. And so as a high school, I was like, what, you know, I was hungry for that. I was hungry for so much more than just attending church service. So I went to ministry school and um, it was everything and so much more than I could have hoped for as far as really just being immersed in a culture that knows how to do life well and a kingdom life that actually brings heaven to earth. So yeah, it was amazing. It was the first best year of my life because I also learned how to just pursue God in a way that every year gets better and better. So it's been awesome. That was what I did before I started studying nutrition. Well, I think that's a fantastic answer. So you've got uh, sort of uh, uh, twin disciplines, if you like. Yeah. You've got the discipline of ministry and theological education, and you've got the discipline of nutrition science. Yeah. And that leads me to uh, our first question, Laurel, uh, that sometimes it could be that um, people regard uh, spiritual life and nutrition and physical life as somehow complementary. Do, yeah. do you work with the two as complementary, that they work together uh, rather than working against each other? Because you've got the, the twin background of training, do you see yeah. a natural between spirituality and nutrition science? So I can give you a resounding yes for that. And it really comes from, I guess, my journey into nutrition really started while I was at ministry school. So while I'm at ministry school, I guess the background of really how I got into nutrition is it's an interesting year where people from all over the world um, come to study in this one place. We're in 
one town, all pursuing God every single day (laughs) for nine months. And, you know, you don't usually get that sort of setup of your life is literally set up to just pursue him and learn more um, and walk it out. And so while I'm nurturing my spiritual health, like that was that was all that was the whole focus for nine months of my life really no distractions. It felt like Um, I was not taking care of my body well. And so while I'm pursuing spiritual health, I was really neglecting my physical health. And I was doing so in a way that the Holy Spirit really convicted me of, hey, you're neglecting the one body I gave you to host my spirit, but to also live life and to do what you're called to do. And so one day while I had just, I probably had had ice cream. It was this sort of dysfunctional relationship with food where if I ate something that I didn't think was healthy or wasn't healthy, then I would punish myself by working out. And so that, that's not good, (laughs) terrible model to follow. And um, when I was doing that, I probably ate something bad. And then I went on a run and I felt really guilty about it. And when I got back from my run, Um, I just felt like the presence of God come upon me. And there was this real conviction of spiritual health should manifest itself into physical health. And because you lack health and identity, so he targeted a spiritual issue of I lack the identity of self-love, of loving myself and seeing myself as he loves me. There were repercussions for the neglect in that area into physical health where that was actually what was causing me to punish myself for eating food? (laughs) Well, well, I mean, that problem of body image is something that has terribly afflicted Mm. the female part of the population. But uh, from what I gather, the statistics are saying now there is an increase in in males who have exactly the same problem. This is a big issue uh, for young young people, isn't it? Yeah. So it's huge. And it, th- there was just so much irony in that moment where I was trying to get so spiritually healthy, yet I was not focusing on my physical health at all. And it was interesting how the two were so interconnected where God first targeted a spiritual issue that was manifesting itself physically in the way that I was treating myself. Um, and when he did that, I heard the phrase, the only phrase I heard was healthy in, healthy out. And I just kept hearing those four words repeated over and over in my spirit of healthy in, healthy out. And that's actually what began, I guess, my journey of figuring out what that really looks like. Because it's a cute catchphrase, but what does it mean? What's the practical representation? And just a quick question for you as well, Laurel. I mean, just from the things that you've been saying so far, it sounds like once you started to acknowledge and become aware of what you were putting into your body as well, did you begin to notice that there was a change in your spiritual dynamic as well? And how how did that um, manifest itself? Yeah, that's a good question, Stuart. So um, it's really interesting to know which one comes first. And I think because, um, you know, when you do life with Holy Spirit, like your spirit being, you have a spirit. And in that, I think for me, my spiritual health really determines almost how I then nourish my body. And so when I'm in a yucky place spiritually, if I just have, you know, not really been tending to my spirit and my spirit health, um, I find that that is what then causes me to make poor choices. That's when like I'll, I'll eat food for comfort, you know, I'll go to sugar and I'll go to sweets and that will be a way to comfort myself. And that's because I'm not actually getting comfort from where my source should come from, which is the Holy Spirit. Um, And then vice versa, as the more I tend to the spiritual health, then I'm empowered to actually make better choices when it comes to food. Uh, There's God's grace to have, you know, self-discipline and self-control and just the ability to say no to what might not be that great for you in pursuit of what is good for you. Having having said that, it it seems to me because you... uh earn your living as a nutrition coach, uh, you you must have developed a set of principles, uh, simple, easy to memorize uh, things that ordinary folk like us can can easily get hold of. And I'm kind of curious as to what what would be the three most basic principles that you believe 
you want every one of your clients to get a, uh, get a hold of? Yeah, I'm going to give you five. <laughs> awesome. I call them my five habits. <laughs> so the five habits, um, they're, the first two are called anchor habits. And these are the two habits that you can do no matter what life looks like. So life is really busy. You're really stressed. You didn't do a grocery shop where you have fruits and vegetables. Everything's a mess. These are the two habits that you can still do. And the first one is eating slowly. Um, eating slowly is a real struggle in our day and age. <laughs> we are a fast paced um, you know, culture where everything's on the go and we're so stressed and we're so rushed. So just slowing down while you eat, the recommendation is to take 20 minutes to actually sit down, chew your food slowly, put your fork down between bites, um, maybe even enjoy a meal with someone else so that you're engaging with someone else while you're eating, um, but just to take your time. So that first one is to eat slowly. The second anchor habit is to stop at 80% full. So in eating slowly, you're actually able to register um, when you're starting to get full, whereas when you eat fast, it's very easy to overeat. Of We all, we all have probably done it. <laughs> I know I've done it. Is the faster you eat, the more you overeat. So um, to stop eating at 80% full, and that's an interesting number of, okay, well, what does that actually feel like? But it's just registering, hey, I'm not yet stuffed, but I'm comfortable. It's that real, like, comfortable phase of when you're eating. Um, and then the other three are at every meal. Um, I use my hands to teach my clients portion sizing. And so at every meal, you want to ask yourself, where are the vegetables? So that is... One of the most important things is no matter what, where are the vegetables on the plate? And we use um, our fist. So everybody, I painted today, <laughs> I have paint on my arm, but um, everybody can use their fist and that also represents your body size. So for a fist of vegetables, you want at least one to two at every meal. And then the second question that you ask yourself is where's the protein? So you use this the palm of your hand, everyone should be getting at least one palm of protein at every meal. And then where are the, where's the fat? So you want a couple thumbs of fat, and that's your cooking oil, your avocado, your nuts and seeds. So those are the three most important things that should be on your plate, and that forms the five habits. And yeah, and that's um, it's as simple as can be. <laughs> Uh, and yet, uh, yeah, I think those are, that's a great way of putting it uh, in a very easy kind of package to to a client or, yeah. or to someone like myself who has to be very careful uh, with diet. Um, uh, uh, and a number of us in the uh, in the congregation here uh, at that kind of age and stage where diet becomes not all consuming, but it is pretty critical <laughs> that we follow yeah. the, the medical advice. Now, everything that you said, I, I admire and I try to do. Uh, we know from our survey before we began recording that the, uh, the people that are watching this live said, <laughs> I think they said sometimes, no, I said sometimes I'm able to follow. Yeah. 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 They, said, they said usually, and I mean, I think that usually can sort of be swing quite a lot of, quite far, can't it, um, <laughs> with people that, because I mean, when I sort of, I mean, I'm one of Laurel's clients, and when I first sat down with her, um, she got me to track out a three-day of meal plan of what I eat, and I actually quickly discovered that a lot of the things that you sometimes assume are healthy are actually not, and is, is that something yeah. which you find can often be a bit troubling in, in today's society that there's so much information out there, Laurel, that people don't really know where to start? Yeah. Um, one of the biggest problems is there is too much information. Um, and in doing so, we almost use confusion as a cop-out of I'm so confused about nutrition, I just won't do anything. But really, if we uncomplicated it, like the five habits I just gave you, let's stick with just the food habits. Protein, veggies, fat. If we focus on those three, how simple is that? And I think, and it's nature's food. It's it's as natural as it gets, but we have we've just overcomplicated it so much in such an unnecessary way. Um, where if we actually eat just the food that's edible <laughs> that nature produces for us, it really solves all of our problems. 
Um, I think it's when we try and figure out what, you know, the marketing team is doing at Countdown or Pack and Save for different foods where it's for profit. And if we just eliminated all of that and focused on the basics of just what does nature produce for us to eat? I, I, I picked up particularly on the first two points about uh, eating slowly. And yeah. I can say he's one of your clients, but he doesn't eat slowly. I've seen him <laughs> eat. Giving away the so, secrets already. Yeah, <laughs> you, you got to work on that with. Uh, yeah, it's told on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I, I, I picked that up as a kind of hidden spiritual principle. Mm. Because what you, all the emphasis that you made was on taking time with food. Now, if you yeah. think about it doesn't matter whether you're a Christian or a Buddhist or a Hindu, people with a religious outlook tend to be thankful for the food that they have because we know that so much of the world doesn't have food. So out of that sense of gratitude, taking the time to really prepare it well and taking the time to uh, eat with family mm. uh, and friends if possible um, just changes everything uh, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Uh, you, you, you said don't get caught up, well if you get caught up in the busyness of life you know everything happens at a fast pace. And uh, that's that's what happened to me. I think uh, I, I I like being busy. I like being active in so many different areas. But that doesn't give me the correct balance that I should have with food. So I really relate that yeah, first awesome. one as a kind of spiritual uh, insight. And then there's that fantastic second one. And my I can remember my parents said this to me. Stop eating before you you think you're full. They didn't have an eighty percent rule, but yeah. similar kind of thing. What about in your family, Stuart? Did you? Well, yeah. I mean, I think my it was actually my grandma who told me that the whole eighty percent rule revolves around the amount of time it takes. And you might know be able to elaborate on this a bit more, Laurel. The time it takes for your body to actually realize just how much it's got in it yeah. um, in that period of time. Um, and it, it's it not a slot machine, you know. We like food into the stomach. It's not an instantaneous action. Um, there's actually a process and a little map that it takes to get to its destination, and it's not that quick. So that's why the twenty or the twenty minute rule is um, so important of just taking your time because you're not yet registering the fullness if you just gorge your food quickly. Stuart will work on that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, Stuart, I didn't mean to drop you in that with your coat. <laughs> yeah. um, Stuart uh, also had a particular question uh, that's uh, less about these general principles, but I want to say thank you for those general principles because we'll write them up and we'll, we'll put yeah. them in the about section of the video. But Stuart had a particular question about the relationship of diet. Uh, to was it mental health? In yeah. General? So I mean, there was there's been quite a few posts out there recently, Laurel, that have been talking about the relationship between I think just general gut health and the potential which an unhealthy um, gut or digestive system or insides tends to have on some things. How it can possibly aggravate certain types of anxieties or depression mm. or stresses and that kind of thing and. It would yeah. be interesting to sort of get your thoughts and insights, having studied it, on um, where you see that relationship lying and, and how it affects all of those things. Yeah, so for anyone who is interested, before I go into the um, brief recap on that, if anyone's interested in mental health in your diet, I recommend the book A Mind of Your Own by Kelly Brogan. And it really dives thoroughly into this topic. And she's an expert on it. Um, she's a... a psychologist. She's now become a holistic psychologist because in her practice as just a general psychologist, she was really fed up with prescription medicine not actually setting people free from anxiety and mood disorders like depression and schizophrenia. Um, and when she started experimenting with food, how food affects your mood, um, she has testimonies of people who are schizophrenic. They went to a whole food-based diet, which 
the key with depression and all mood disorders and how food affects those mood disorders is really an issue of inflammation. Um, so your gut and your brain actually connect far more than, even though they're quite a ways away from each other, um, just the connection with your health is huge. And so while that's a science that we're still learning a lot about, we don't know exactly what the relationship really is, but one of the biggest issues is inflammation. Um, and food can either promote inflammation or be anti-inflammatory in the body. And so the connection was that yes, hands down, no doubt about it, food affects your mood. Because um, the testimony she had was people who were schizophrenic their entire life. This is the extreme example. Um, she does a process where she doesn't take them off medication all at once because that's quite dangerous. But as she slowly lowered the medication over time and increased a whole food diet that eliminated sugar, grains, dairies, um, and industrial fats, which are all inflammatory, um, this person was healed of schizophrenia where those symptoms vanish and they never had it again. So there's a lot of testimonies like that which science is now trying to prove, we've got to catch up of, okay, what's actually going on behind the scenes, but people are trialing this for themselves and the results are amazing. Uh, a couple of months back, I did an interview with David Lorimer, who's the uh, executive director of the Scientific and Medical Network in uh, Great Britain. And that network has for a long time looked at complementary medicines, uh, alongside of the best of um, uh, normalized medical practice and how the two work together. But one of the fascinating things was that they did a survey of scientists, 3,000 scientists, including doctors, nutritionists, the, the whole spectrum of science. Um, and they had 1,000 in the UK, 1,000 in France, and 1,000 in Germany. So it's a massive survey. It was done as an totally independent bit of research from the uh, SMN. But what, what emerged m most significantly were regional differences. Uh, so you would find that, uh, just for example's sake, in the United Kingdom, there was a lot more skepticism about complementary medicine than there was in Germany, where there was a, a real training of doctors around mm -hmm. different kinds of therapies, and a different set of therapies again in France. So there were these clear regional differences, but when you analyze the data, it, it, for the medical fraternity in France and Germany, there was not the slightest question that um, a strictly mechanistic approach to medicine uh, didn't work. They they recognised that there needed to be spiritual dimensions as well, yeah. um, and uh, there also needed to be complementary ap approaches. And that's why I think that uh, your work is a particular interest. Now, I'm just tossing this in sort of out of the ether, Laurel, <laughs> you, you've, you're, you're set up in Taupo. It's a long way from Carolina, North Carolina. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so what's it like being a nutrition coach at the bottom of the world as compared to being a nutrition coach in uh, North Carolina? I mean, are you finding that it's a hard kind of sell to get your message across? Um, or are you finding it easier than you would have anticipated? <laughs> I have to watch myself because I'm speaking to all Kiwis. Um, I love New Zealanders, but I find that this culture is very different than the culture is back home. And I don't, there's pros and cons of back home, anything to do with fitness, nutrition, improving your body image, it sells easy. Um, it's really easy to make money off of that. And I'm finding it a bit more of a touchy subject here of um, perhaps the culture isn't as um, open and transparent about, you know, what I'm doing is I'm not just staying surface level with my clients of telling them what to do. I'm actually diving into root issues and figuring out why they make the choices that they make around food. Um, and it's, it's different. It's, um, it's a bit of a challenge to crack kiwis open sometimes. 
I, I am fascinated by that answer. Uh, I think that's a really honest answer. And I think it highlights the fact that most of our uh, medical profession uh, were trained out of the UK model as opposed to, say, mm -hmm. out of the French model or the German model. And there's, of course, been a tremendous change in America in the last 20, 30 <clears throat> years where uh, prior to that, there was a pretty mechanistic view of medicine and spirituality didn't really get a, a mention. But then there was that terrific survey done on the effect of uh, intercessory prayer mm. on recovery of heart attack um, and you know bypass people and all of that kind of patients. And from that time on, there's been a, a tremendous flourishing across all the teaching medical universities in the United States, where you're as likely to find spiritual dimensions talked about um, much more openly, much more freely. And that includes complementary yeah. um, things. But you're actually mainstream nutritionist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because I actually, um, while, you know, my faith is really important to me, when a client comes to me, I let them lead the way of where we're going to go with this. And if they want to bring spirituality into the process, then that's awesome. Um, but because I am, I'm just your, your average nutritionist, nutrition coach, that's not like a mandatory thing that we're going to discuss in our sessions. And some people, like, that's what they want to bring into the equation. And I have so much fun with that. But then I also respect those who they aren't there. They don't want to go there, and that's fine. Um, but then we're still going to get into, I guess, more so the behavioral change and the psychology of it. And that still kind of represents a holistic factor as well, not just nutrition alone. Laurel, there was a great question which came in from Julie earlier on, which was um, pretty much saying a lot of people don't think about making dietary changes until some sort of health issue comes up. How exactly do we go about dealing with that? How would you approach that? Yeah, well, unfortunately, we all have, fortunately and unfortunately, we all have free will. Um, and so that's a tough one. Uh, for a lot of people, it takes a health issue for them to actually become conscientious of how the food that they're eating is affecting um, just their state of health. So I think in one way, perhaps it's a personal thing of lead by example where if we are conscientious of what we're putting into our body and we're aware of, um, I guess, preventative nutrition, you know, preventing um, just any health scares in the future by just being really intentional with taking care of our body now, we're leading by example. And that's really all that you can do of, um, you know, we've all experienced where you can preach to someone something that's really good for them till um, the sun goes down, but until they actually it resonates within them, within them that it's something that they want to do, it will fall in deaf ears. So it's tricky of it's unfortunate because we love people and we want to, I guess, you know, we want the best for them, but we actually can't force them to do anything that they're not willing and able to um, pursue on their own. And diet's obviously something that has to come from within. Yeah, and I guess Julie's question arises out of the particular context that she's for uh many, many years been a practice nurse. And so, <laughs> you know, there's going to be that gap between giving uh, patients or clients the information and their ability to actually act on it. And that leads yeah. us to uh, James's question, which is, can you explain, please, the difference between dieting and what you do? I love this question. I'm glad this was asked. Um, as interesting as it is, I'm a nutritionist and I hate diets. I hate dieting and I hate putting people on diets because um, it's proven not to work. We've all seen it that there are a ton of diets out there and what turns into is just yo-yo dieting where the mindset of dieting is I'm going to make a bunch of extreme changes um, this is different. I'm putting Stuart on one, but this is for athletic purposes. But for the most part, people go on these diets, they change a lot all at once, and it only lasts for a short period of time. Because the statistic goes something like this. If you try and change one thing at a, at a time, you have, say, a 90% success rate. 
as soon as you try and change two things at one time, it goes down to 25% success rate. So that's the greatest flaw in dieting is it's not sustainable. Um, it's always for this one goal of just let me hit my goal weight. But then if you don't actually change the habits that you acquired throughout your entire lifetime, um, you'll just resort right back to them. And so the difference between what I do and dieting is I'm actually coaching people through behavior change one step at a time so that it's sustainable long after their time with me. I think that's a fantastic answer. Uh, <laughs> and, and I really like that. Could I also suggest that when you're next uh, dealing with your client, Stuart McAdam, huh. you give him some tennis coaching because no matter <laughs> what he <laughs> does with his diet, he, he clearly, he's too afraid to actually meet me on the court. <laughs> All right, we'll work on that. <laughs> um, it's been great having you along. I'd like to say thank you very much indeed, and uh, maybe we can come back and do some more discussion yes. about other aspects uh, sometime no, awesome. next year. Yeah, thank you.